G'day guys, Ryde here, your Chief Espresso Officer. And today I wanna to talk to you a bit about our coffee packaging. How to learn to order coffee online. All of the jargon, all of the things that you don't understand. And what you can take away with that, that's specific to your situation, how you drink your coffee, what machine you have. When you go to order coffee online next time, how to do that in the correct way. This is a long time in the making. So let's get into how to buy your coffee online. So when you're purchasing coffee online, the first thing you wanna look at is are you buying a blend or a single origin? And what's the difference between them both? What most people don't realize is that a single origin means the coffee comes from one single country or area. In this case, Yoga Chef is a region in Ethiopia. So a single origin means coming from one single place. But it's as broad as the country because single origin coffee doesn't necessarily mean it comes from the same farm, doesn't necessarily mean it has the same variety of coffee beans in there. It doesn't even mean if it does come from the same farm that it comes from the same lot, because they might have multiple lots on one farm. But what it does mean is that this coffee comes from the country. It's gonna have unique flavors depending on that particular harvest or roast farmer region, everything. A blend is multiple countries. Doesn't always have to be multiple countries. You can blend the same countries in there, but it means it's a curated flavor, which means you we have deliberately designed this coffee to taste a certain way. And using three or more different beans, we create stability. And the stability means that we can give you this coffee all year round with those flavors. Even if one of the beans isn't available, you can usually find a similar bean to switch it out to create the same flavor. If you wanna learn more about the blends versus single origins, check out the video here, and you can go into a deep dive specifically on that topic. General rule of thumb is, if you want a particular flavor that you're going for, whether it be sort of multi caramelies or dark chocolates, and you drink it with milk, then a blend is gonna be better for you because you're always gonna be able to find that one, and it will always taste the same. It will always be available. Single origin is more if you want to dive into the different flavors of each region, and really understand what's going on inside your particular coffee and you drink it without milk. Even if you do drink it with milk, you can find some good single origins, but they may not always be available. The price will fluctuate, the availability will fluctuate. So you might get a coffee from Ethiopia, but it might not be from this particular part, Conga Cabelli, and it might not even be from this particular farm. Now, the most important thing that I want you to look for on your bag is the flavors and to understand what those flavors actually mean. Because there's a couple of confusing things when it comes to flavors of coffee. The first thing is when you see the flavors here, understand that we are talking about the natural characteristics of coffee, not added flavors or the beans are being soaked in vanilla. That's where they get their vanilla flavors from. No, these are flavors that are naturally occurring in this particular coffee. Now in a blend, the flavors might be designed to be drunk with milk. So they might be more relevant than as a single origin. Generally, the single origin flavors are coming from the growers themselves, sometimes from the roasters, but these are the characteristics that have been first determined right at the very beginning of the processing stage. And so what roasters do with those flavors is they try to extract those same flavors out of the coffee once they get hold of it. Also, remember, these can be suggestions. So if you're new to coffee, ignore the individual flavors and look for the broader flavors. So if they talk about chocolates, broad chocolate flavor. If they talk about apricots, just think of stone fruits. If they talk about blueberries, just think of berries in general. Sometimes blueberries is more prominent, but not everyone can pick up on that flavor, especially if you're starting out in coffee. Think broad flavors, nutty, fruity, tangy. Those sort of flavors will help you determine what flavors you like, and then you can look for the key words when you're ordering coffee. There are definitely times where the flavors just get run away with people like marketing, get hold of them and put in names like pink Persian fairy floss and raisin toast and apple crumble with ice cream on top. These are just made up. They're suggestions. Someone has thought about that and gone, that reminded me of a flavor that I tasted one time over here and that's why I've described it like that. If you look up on the Specialty Coffee Association, there's a wheel there and that will show you some of the aromas, bad tastes and the good taste that you might find in coffee. So that's a more helpful way of learning how to describe the coffee 
And at the end of the day, you've just got to find out what you enjoy, the flavors that you enjoy, and try to align them as best you can with the flavor notes on your coffee. Now, there's a lot more to the tastes of coffee than just the flavors. There's the aftertaste, there's the mouthfeel, that's how heavy or silky it sits on your tongue. There's acidity. There's a whole lot of stuff that I haven't put on my labels because I like to keep a lot of the information and there's not enough space on this. So I use a digital format to present all that information. So if you jump online and look up Yoga Chef on my website, you'll see there all of the other information relating to the taste. The next thing you wanna look at on your coffee is what the region is. If you're buying a single origin coffee, you wanna look at where this region is because like I said, these countries are quite large. Not all Ethiopian coffees taste the same and certainly not ones from inside Yoga Chef. So you need to look at what the region is and if they have the information of the farms or the washing station, even further refining your geography down to that smallest point so that when you go look for that coffee again, you go, right, I know I need to look for Conga Cabelli. So the important thing about region, not all coffees taste the same. When you talk about French wines, you don't assume that every single French wine is the same. Same when you talk about New Zealand wines. So why would every coffee from Ethiopia taste the same? One thing that really frustrates me is when somebody comes in, they'll say, I hate Costa Rican coffee. Yes, I'm looking at you, James. But the reality is they hated that particular Costa Rican coffee that they once had that reminded them of a dirty ashtray. However, that doesn't mean all Costa Ricans taste that way. That was just the way that that particular one might have tasted to that individual. So it's really getting away from all coffees are a blanket flavor and starting to understand that each region has a different rainfall, different climate, different humidity, different altitude that it's growing at, different way of processing it, and all of those different variables add to the way that the coffee tastes. The regions are there to help you narrow down on those particular coffees, like saying, I love a Sauvignon Blanc that comes from the Marlboro region in New Zealand. The Marlboro region is one area with multitudes of farms on it that grow beautiful grapes, perfect for Sauvignon Blancs. But that's just one region, and New Zealand is a big country with lots of regions in it. So just like New Zealand, coffee should be viewed in the same way, and one of the things you should be looking at is the region that it comes from. Those are probably the most important things to recognize on your labels of coffee. The other one that I want you to start getting an understanding Four is the process, because the process directly affects the flavor in your cup. Now there's two main processes of coffee, and what I mean by processing is when they pick the cherries off the trees, yes, they're cherries, they're not a bean. When they pick the cherries off the trees, and they lay them out, and they can dry them, or they can wash them. And they're the two main processing techniques used in coffee. They're called natural, or unwashed, and washed, fully washed. And then there's a whole bunch of different ones that use a blend of both and other fermentation techniques like carbonic maceration. But I'm not gonna go into them in this video. If you really wanna learn about it, you can check out this video here on all the different types of processing. But understanding the basics. So a natural coffee, they dry them out and they allow to ferment a lot more. So a lot of those juicy flavors come from the cherry flesh into the seed itself and that can end up in your coffee. So that makes it a brighter, more intense, tangy, fruity flavored. Not always does that go well with milk. Sometimes it can cause it to taste a little bit like curdled milk because it's so tangy and sour. But as a black coffee, if you're drinking coffee as a black and you wanna really understand the flavors behind this fermentation process called natural processing, then definitely look for a coffee that has natural processing on it. The washed or fully washed processing gives more of the flavor to the unique variety of coffee itself because it creates this clean, crisp sort of flavor which really has a sort of a bright acidity which allows it to cut through the milk a lot more and it gives you a smoother drink in the long run. So if you're a milk drinker, like you're drinking lattes, cappuccinos, flat whites, or you're adding milk to your plunger, make sure you look for a washed coffee. They're gonna translate much more to a milk-based drink. Now, this number, you're probably asking, what does that mean? What does quality score even mean? And I think this number is probably the most important number we need to be talking about right now. However, you're not gonna find that number on most coffees. Why? 
I don't really know because if you go out to any other market for any other product, there's usually some sort of quality score on there. You know that a BMW will cost more than a Kia because you've been educated for years and marketed to for years on the quality. And just like wine and just like anything else, coffee has a quality score. It goes from zero to 100 in quality score. And it's not a straight line, it's an exponential curve, which means it's a lot harder to get from 70 to 80 in quality score than it is to get from 50 to 60. Now, we sell specialty coffee, and specialty coffee is a term given to any coffee that scores above 80. Now, the word specialty has been thrown around now for a couple of years against any type of coffee, whether it's in the 70s or in the 60s, it doesn't have to be over 80, but technically it should be above 80. So most of the coffee that you've been purchasing for years now, hundreds of years, has been Robusta, which has a very low quality score, somewhere in about the 60s, somewhere in that region. Whereas Arabica coffee generally isn't anywhere lower than a 70. That doesn't mean that every Arabica coffee tastes great, because as you know, you can go to one coffee shop and it tastes horrible, you can go to another coffee shop and it tastes fantastic and they both sell Arabica coffee. And that, I can tell you, is a direct result of the quality score. See how high this is? This is an 89 quality score. So we're almost in the 90s. We just missed out on one point. There's hardly any defects in the beans at all. They are all the same size. So that means that they ferment at the same rate and you get a nice clean finish throughout. So you don't have those murky, muddying tastes that you get from defective beans. In a lower quality, it means there is a higher rate of defective beans amongst that group. So in 500, you might get quite a few that are defective and they taste like dirty socks and they muddy the flavor of the rest of the beans. You can buy it a little bit cheaper, but the main thing that you need to look out for, if you can find a quality score, look for 80 plus. And if you can't find a quality score, if it tastes murky, muddy, bitter, then it probably is a lower quality coffee. I reckon in the future, this identifier will be much more related to the price. And the higher the number, the more expensive. I think coffees in the 90s will cost more than a couple of hundred dollars a kilo. In the 80s might be 100 plus. And then the coffees that only rank in the 70s will be dirt cheap because they don't really taste as great as coffees that rank 80 plus. Now we're gonna do a bigger video on this in the future. But that's just give you an idea of when you're shopping online, if you can see a quality score, use that to determine how much you love a coffee. Now, acidity is a huge thing. We could talk for hours about how misconceived acidity is. Because acidity doesn't mean the coffee is all acids. And yes, it technically is considered an acid drink, but it's not that much more than say milk. On the pH scale, coffee sits around a five and a six and seven is a neutral score. So one is extremely acidic and two or three is kind of where lemons are. So we're not talking about a hugely acidic drink. And when we talk about acidity, when you're looking at coffee and it says a bright acidity, that doesn't mean it has more acids in it or it has a high amount of acids, it means it has a higher sensation. Instead of thinking of acidity in terms of acid, think of acidity in terms of brightness. So sparkling water, or the taste that grape makes when it bursts in your mouth. That sort of sensation, that tingling sensation that you'll get in your mouth, is what we're referring to when we talk about acidity. We should say brightness, but you will see the words high acidity, medium, low, bright, great, strawberry, many different forms of acidity. And if you think of it in terms of that tingling sensation and you enjoy that tingling sensation, then that's what you should be thinking about in terms of acidity. Now, if you want to get a less acidic coffee, then you want to look at dark roasted coffee. However, the problem is, is that it will be a lot more bitter because the roasting process creates a lot more of those chlorogenic acids and the longer you roast, the more come present, that gives it that bitterness. So while a lighter roast coffee will be more acidic flavored and you might not enjoy the sourness or that fruitiness or that intensity, then you wanna go for a darker roast. I, however, would say that the medium roast coffee is probably the best as an all rounder. Unless you're drinking filter coffee, then you can definitely focus on a light roast. But if you're drinking espresso, plunger, mocha pot, AeroPress, most of the other brewers out there, 
you're better off going middle of the road with a medium or a medium light roast coffee because they have all of those nuances, the characteristics are brought out, and it's a little bit less acidic than your light roast, so you won't have that full-on sourness in your mouth. Uh, the reason I stray away from dark roasted coffee is because it's like a meat. When you have a really great steak, you don't want to burn it so it's completely well done because then it doesn't have any of the natural flavors and it just tastes like charcoal. The reason you would cook a steak or any meat that's tougher longer, it helps change it so that it's more edible. Coffee is the same. When you have a low quality coffee, and remember we talked about the quality score, when you have a low quality coffee, you need to roast it a little bit longer because you need to get rid of some of those defect flavors. What happens in doing so is that it be tastes a bit more roasty, a bit more bitter, and a bit darker. It's not as fun, and the natural characteristics of the coffee are lost. When you want the best tasting coffee, go a medium or even a light roasted coffee. For espresso, medium is absolutely the best. For filter, light roast is perfect. Now, roasting dates on coffees are super important. Now we found out that coffee does have a perfect window of time to use it in. Supermarket coffees will not probably put a roasted date on. They will just put an expiry date on. That's something that's just to cover themselves for any lawsuits against them in the future if someone drinks it after the expiry date. But really, coffee doesn't ever go off. It just gets less and less flavorsome until it eventually just tastes like nothing. Most of the oils will just evaporate. What we know about espresso is that you ideally have a window between about 10 to 14 days after roasting is when you want to start using it. This is for espresso, remember? When you start using it 10 to 14 days afterwards and you can use it for about a maximum of two months depending on if you store it properly. Most people will want to use it up within a month. If you're drinking a filter coffee, this time frame is a lot shorter. You want to start drinking it within three to five days after roasting and you want to try and finish it within around a week, maybe two weeks maximum. That way you're going to get all of those beautiful nuances in the coffee itself. If you go beyond about three weeks, you're going to miss a lot of those small nuances of the flavors, the natural characteristics in the coffee itself, and you're going to get some more lifeless tastes instead. Stove tops and plungers and French presses they actually are less fussy than espresso and filter coffee. So you can get away with using coffees which are much older in a French press than you can in an espresso or in a filter. And the reason for this is because they just immerse the grinds in the water and extract a lot of those beautiful flavors from the grinds. And the longer you steep it, the more it keeps extracting until it hits the peak and it can't extract any more out of there and it just starts extracting some unfriendly flavors. If you're buying supermarket coffee, you just want to take the expiry date off. The expiry date's usually one or two years. So go backwards from the expiry date on supermarket coffee and that will give you some indication of when it's been roasted. Normally, it's been sitting on the shelves for at least three months before you even purchase it, which is well past the perfect use by a date that you would want to get a perfect espresso. Why we put a roasted date on there is so that you know that you're getting fresh coffee every time. We don't send out coffee if it's two weeks old because that's two weeks and a week to get to you and then another six to eight weeks to use it up. It's well past its prime and that really doesn't make for a good customer experience. So we want you to get your coffee as soon as you can, but if you get it before 10 days old, let it sit for a bit, let it rest. Open the bag up maybe just a little bit to get some of the air in there and help it oxidize and that'll just bring down that level of gas and you won't have such a sourness in your coffee. Now, a quick thing on sizes. It depends on how much you drink, but if you're living on your own and you're having one cup of coffee a day, then stick to a 500 or 250 gram bag and you just buy them more regularly. If you've got two in your household and you have at least two coffees a day, you want to go to a one kilo bag. Store it properly in an airtight container and it will last you two months and still taste mostly fantastic right up until the end. So you don't really need to worry about buying coffee weekly unless you want to have that perfect filter coffee. And then you might want to get a weekly coffee purchase just to keep your coffee as fresh for your filters. That's it for how to buy coffee online. One last thing I would ask you to look at is who are you buying coffee from? If you're buying coffee from a huge global conglomerate, chances are they're not paying enough attention to the farmers and the farms that give them their coffee and they're trying to cut corners paying the lowest possible price to get 
a decent quality coffee and sometimes not even a good quality coffee. So look at who you're buying from. Do they have a sustainability project? Do they do stuff for your communities in local and abroad? Do they look after the farmers? Do they care about the environment? And if so, if they do all of those things, try to support them. A lot of small roasters like us now are focusing on the sustainability of coffee for the future because there could be a real situation where we actually run out of coffee to drink, at least the good quality stuff. The large coffee companies are trying to push the price down so that the farmers don't have to make that much money and they can keep their profit margins. And they'll be telling you that the price of coffee costs heaps and blah, blah, blah. That's just to serve their agenda. We know that good quality coffee does cost a lot of money and therefore we have to pay the farmers to grow this a lot more so that they can look after their farms, reinvest it into their technology and support their families at the same time. So there are a lot of things going on in the world of coffee that the consumer doesn't see about and hopefully by doing this video, get a little bit of insight in understanding how to buy coffee, what all this jargon means, so that when you go out and buy coffee next online, you know exactly what to look for for your setup. I'm Ryde, your Chief Espresso Officer. Enjoy your brew.